Please welcome to the stage Jennifer LeBeau, Luke Sant, and Michael Shannon. Can I be a total geek before we start? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of people I for, uh, important people I forgot to thank are um, my friends at Sony who allowed us to make this film, which as a filmmaker you know is very important. So my uh, deep thanks to those here tonight, Richard Story, uh, Adam Block, and my colleagues in arms, uh, Richard Alcock, Jeroen Vandermeer, and Jeffrey Schilberg. Thank you so much. That didn't sound geeky at all, <laughs> sorry. So, um, let's talk about the footage, because the footage was thought to have been lost for a long time now. And where was it residing all that time? The footage um, was eventually found, as, um, uh, as happens a lot, especially in the period of the 70s and 80s, and with an artist like Dylan, there are reams of material that basically live. And until you start specifically going through and looking th through literally reels and reels and reels, which might not be labeled correctly, which is 99% of the time, the truth, um, you feel it is gone. And this actually went through three rounds of finding piece by piece. The original um, cut uh, material that a lot of people are familiar with um, from Toronto. Um, and this material um, was later found. The footage um, that's used in the film has not been seen before. It's from some additional shows that were shot in Buffalo and an additional day in At Toronto. the end of the tour. Yeah. Um, and uh, a lot of people don't realize, kind of take it for granted that film, I, actually the video that was shot during that period in many ways is more fragile than film. Uh, yes. <laughs> That was uh, one of the biggest challenges, was definitely um, working with the material, making sure we could have it look um, good uh, and, and present accordingly. So luckily, uh, Mr. Dillon's team takes uh, good care if it takes a little bit to find and have a genius group of um, archivists that work with them as well. So, um, Luke, when you were, sorry, I didn't mean to surprise you, um, when you were, constructing an idiom for these sermons, uh, I'm getting the sense you didn't have like a, a specific sect or, you know, moment in mind. It's, it feels like it comes from, you know, kind of the deep American past, but that it's from many times. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, I haven't, well, my experience of sermons is minimal personally, yeah. but doesn't feel like I did it have a great body of sermonistic literature at my fingertips, as it were, mm -hmm. which is uh, the collected works of the great African-American preachers who were recorded in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. uh, Reverend J.M. Gates, Reverend D.C. Rice, Reverend A.W. Nix. Um, and, you know, I just listened to those and read the transcripts over and over again and absorbed their message. Mm -hmm. And, you know, without um, going too much into the uh, sinners in the hands of an angry God territory, yeah. more, you know, a moral sense uh -huh. derived therefrom. But also the language is rooted in everyday stuff like exactly. uh, and cleaning speaking the to wood. Exactly, and speaking to a community. And watch out for things slithering in through the scullery window. Mm -hmm. I'm going <laughs> to keep an eye on my scullery window <laughs> from now on, I think. Um, Michael, how did you work with these words? Because uh, you did an amazing job, I have to say. It's incredible. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, Quite welcome. Well, you know, um, you know, I, I, I'm not going to lie. This whole thing was kind of uh, flabbergasting from the outset. Uh, I got a call saying, you know, um, Bob Dylan's manager wants to talk to you. Um, and Bob Dylan's been an inspiration of mine for years. Uh, I, I literally, sometimes when I'm doing theater, I listen to his records on a, on a Walkman before I go out on stage to try and get my act together. So the fact that this is, was coming my way was a little overwhelming. Um, but fortunately, apparently, according to one of my older sisters, 
I've uh, been doing this ever since I was a toddler. Um, she said I used to walk around the house in a diaper with a book in my hand, uh, basically like yelling gibberish and acting like I was, you know, I don't know, converting people or whatever. I don't know. I've been, I've just had this preacher uh, uh, neural pathway since I was uh, a little little boy and. Um, you know, I, I come from Kentucky, and uh, it, Kentucky is, I love it and I don't love it, um, but it's a very religious place, and um, and my mother is incredibly religious, uh, she always has been, and um, uh, so I just, you know, I think I drew on that, um, and the words were so beautiful that uh, Luke wrote, um, I spent a couple of weeks with the material just by myself up on the roof of my building, uh, pacing around, muttering to myself. And, and we shot all the sermons in two days. Um, we shot the first three in one day and the last three the uh, second day. And, um, and Jen was so lovely. And, and Ellen Curris, our Ellen Curris, DP. We had this whole, what church was that that we had? It was a church up on the Upper East Side, uh, uh, Episcopalian Church. It was a beautiful, stunning church. And Jen had so beautifully planned out how, where each sermon would be and how it would start very conventionally. And uh, eventually I would start milling around the church. And I think that, that helped a lot. I think if I would have been at the pulpit for every sermon, it would start to get a little redundant. But... Um, yeah, I don't know. The suits help. The suits uh, <laughs> definitely put me in a certain frame of mind. Yeah. I wanted to ask all the three of you actually to start the ball rolling before we open up to the audience about your relation to the music from this particular phase of the career. Um, everybody knows, you know, it's there in the movie, the controversy, I guess, for lack of a better word, that it caused. I have to say, in retrospect, looking back at all of Dylan's music, it doesn't, it just, it's always there. It's just a little bit more present um, during this period. Um, and I'm wondering how you felt about it individually. Um, it was new to me to first um, delve into, other than a few of the songs on Slow Train. Um, and I was, um, starting going in actually quite nervous. <laughs> I am uh, a uh, Jewish American daughter of a rabbi. <laughs> so Bobby Zimmerman is Bobby Zimmerman, you know, Bob Dylan. So, um, but what was beautiful and one of what, what was, um, I think one of the great ways to be able to present the music is exactly as you said, like in terms of what his, his lyrical language is about, it really is consistent um, in terms of the, the thematics, whether you're um, looking at the songs from a purely New Testament perspective or not. <laughs> and uh, it was one of the reasons I was so, um, I feel so glad and I'm so blessed, forgive the term, uh, that we had Luke and uh, Michael join us for this because I think it really allowed allows the viewer to focus on the music, which was really the intent of all of this. All of this research, uh, finding all of this material, came amongst the same time as uh, finding uh, and getting ready to look into a new bootleg series of Bob's, um, which comes out shortly. Which will be called Trouble No More as well. That is correct. And is this available with that, those, if you yes. get that, mm -hmm. you get this? Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's only nine ninety nine, right? It's, I'll but get you a copy. Not, but it's not going to sound as yeah, good, yeah. and it's not going to be as big. Um, so, and and that's one of the things that I think it allows you to focus on on Bob, uh, the artist and the performer, um, versus um, you know any other any other language that we need it. Yeah, you can count me a convert, uh, as it were, <laughs> to to this phase of the career. Because I mean, in nineteen eighty, I was not listening to this hippie music, you know, and, um, yeah. and I'm coming back now, I realize how much of his fire he got back. However, you know, may have mislaid it at various times of his career, but you can tell, I mean, his voice, you know, yeah. that's, he's not crooning. He's, that's right. you know, yeah. not, the, not the croon of Nashville Skyline. Yeah. 
this is or Christmas in the heart. Well, yeah, yeah, that too. But uh, <laughs> I mean, he's, we've yeah. had several periods of yeah, cleaning, we have, you yep. know. Uh, but uh, this is um, absolute fire from you know, same vein as uh, Highway 61, except that it's in the service of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. What are you going to say? Michael, were you listening to the, this music at, at the time that um, it came out? Well, again, I, I, I've heard a lot of this music uh, through my mom, actually. Um, she's a huge fan of this period of his career, and um, I definitely was familiar. I mean, I'm familiar. I mean, I just, I just love the guy. I, I, there's, there's very little I haven't listened to. I mean, I, I can't think of another guy who's spent so much time trying to figure out this whole ball of wax than he has and he's been he's so generous like it even comes across in this movie it's he's um he's just giving so much of himself i don't understand how you couldn't be moved by it you know sorry take your time Great movie. Um, this doc very compellingly um, melds religion and music, and I'm just curious for each of you what um, the most compelling religious experience you've had um, has been uh, listening to music or going to a concert in your life. Most compelling religious experience listening at to a music. Con listening yeah. to music. Oh, okay. Well, that's a tall order. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> I mean, I find listening to music a religious experience period is I guess the best way I could describe it and going to concerts um, to you know use a term used a lot is like going to my church uh, being being there live with others who get it and um, that's probably the most spiritual and heightened feeling I feel like I've ever had um, the Bell album by Al Green that's an amazing um, album <laughs> Also, the motets of Jesualdo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've always kind of thought of, I know this is going to sound strange, but um, that song Slippery People by Talking Heads is yeah. a gospel song. Yeah. So when they play that and stop making sense. Well, it yeah. was, and then it was recorded by the Staples Singers. Yeah. Later, right? Covered on. It's interesting because around that time there were a lot of there was a lot of music that was kind of trading in religious imagery and it was f kind of veering in and out of it and uh, particularly by Talking Heads and yeah. I remember when New Picnic Time by Perubu came out which is probably one of the albums you were listening to when you weren't listening to this <laughs> the song Jehovah's Kingdom Comes could have been as it turns out it was literal David Thomas became a Jehovah's Witness well, he but was raised as Jehovah's Witness but then he, but he went back to the faith right yeah yeah but it could have been either way was, but this but this is you know a full de full blown declaration at a time when everybody was kind of you know on the slope wow I'm a little stunned, quite frankly, uh, about how beautiful the performances are the, uh, and the clarity of his delivery, which is um, not always the thing that most jumps to mind uh, with, with Dylan. But I can't help but think about Mavis, you know, and I mean, this is not the film, but I mean, the backstory, Mavis is a backstory in the Dylan life. And, it, and think of Little Richard, or you think of Al Green, and you think of other sort of, mostly of color artists who were popular, who were not afraid to be religious, but in rock and roll, I mean, is this Christian rock? Do you think that this is Christian rock, or is it something different? Um, Mavis being I, Mavis know, Staples for those in the audience. Yeah, right? Mavis Staples. Yeah, like white Christian rock. I, I can't say much about it. The only one, the only, the only white Christian rock I ever spent much time listening to was the Mass in F Minor by the Electric Prunes. <laughs> and past that, don't ask me. Yeah, I know. There's something about the moniker of Christian rock that sounds so uh, institutional. 
Um, it sounds like, like I was saying earlier, you can find it for nine ninety nine in the aisle at Walmart or something. It just seems to have a much deeper, wider uh, parameter to it, I think. And I mean, I hope that the presentation and, and how, we're, uh, how this film comes through almost does take it to a different level. And you're seeing the artist grapple and, and use this almost as a rapper, if you will, at the time and, and part of what he wanted to do as an artist, but uh, less than in that exact category. I would agree. But it is concurrent. When Bell by Out of Green was 1977, was that around that, that's, around the that's same? That's right, it is right around the same yeah, time. Yeah, right around the same time, time and that's yeah. his full-throated, you know, yeah, kind yeah. of coming out Christian album. Right. Yeah, it was definitely a time to be a Christian. It was yeah. also, you know, I mean, Jimmy Carter was president, you, yeah. know, you know, and he was, a real Christian. I mean, he, and he's still like an example of a real Christian. Yeah. Um, and so um, there was nothing cynical about any of this, yeah. you know, would That's right. might take on those shades in later decades, but at the time, no. Mm -hmm. In the back, all the way in the back there. Standing up with a growl. Here you go. Hello. I actually had two questions. Uh, you can answer either one or both. Uh, the first one is, did anyone consider actually using Dylan's gospel sermons inside the movie instead of having uh, fictitious Can sermons? you say that a little bit louder, <laughs> using his gospel? You have to put the mic did, right Did up. anybody consider using Dylan's actual gospel sermons during the movie as opposed to kind of making them up? That would be one question. And the other thing is, did you also consider maybe making it a little bit longer with a little bit more uh, live footage? <laughs> Um, the process of how we um, developed this film was over a period of time. Um, of course, we uh, discussions of going back and forth, we definitely did in terms of using Bob's sermons or not. Um, for those who aren't familiar um, in the, uh, d throughout the tour, Bob occasionally did uh, banter and uh, speak, preach, if you will, um, in between uh, some of the songs. Um, since, since our goal in this was really to focus on the musical, um, the, the musical aspect of this period, it's Bob Dylan. If we were to insert those sermons, that is the only thing it, w it would have, in my opinion, really changed um, what we were attempting um, to do here with this film. And it would have just been um, triggered just entirely stuck in that vein. Um, if you're curious, you can see those on the uh, version of the Toronto um, concert that does exist um, that in a uh, degraded form on YouTube, but it is there. And we know Dylan fans, they are transcribed <laughs> throughout the uh, internet as well. But it wasn't something in particular that we were um, focused on doing for this in the end. And in terms of the length, we also did go back and forth and um, wanted to deliver gold and based on the incredible performances and the material we had from uh, Luke and Michael's participation, um, it, needed, it needed to be kind of right and perfect and, and leave you as I hope most films, good films do, wanting more. Yeah. Here you go. You said you got a call from Dylan's manager, and I was just curious if Bob Dylan had himself had any involvement in this at all, or oh, I uh, uh, well, uh, I don't know. <laughs> as far as I know, my uh, not directly I didn't speak to the great man himself, but my my mandate came from Bob. Six sermons, six topics real sermons, not surrealistic pastiches of sermons, etc. This came from the man himself. So, yeah. I'm not 100% positive if he has seen the film yet, but I hear that um, we know he has it. He's
giving you a workout with the microphone. Sorry about that. Yeah, okay. All right. Hi. Um, you thank you so much for that incredible footage, for sharing that with us. Um, I have a very specific question for the writer um, about the, when you quote, and I don't think there's anyone who's better to misquote than when you're dealing with Bob Dylan that's more justified for misquoting. But when you um, do the sermon about where, um, where fools rush in, where wise men fear, fear to tread, uh, because in Infidels, in uh, Joker Man, he specifically quotes that line with where angels fear angels to tread. Right. Was that on purpose? Um, I, I'd forgotten about that, actually, to tell you the truth. <laughs> and actually, the line that was um, going through my head was, um, Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers, I think. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but um, but I want to make my you know my sources correct. And the earliest citation I could find for that quote was Wise Men. And Angel seems to have been a later interpolation. It's Alexander Pope. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. You get a gold star for that. <laughs> Question for Michael, did you, when, when you were characterizing this preacher, did you feel it important to play him straight or did you put in a touch of Elmer Gantry? Hmm. Um, I didn't really, I wasn't thinking about that so much. I mean, I didn't want to, I mean, a lot of times when I'm, whatever part I'm doing, I'm just trying to figure out what the person I'm portraying is trying to do. So I look at it like this guy is trying to do this and he wants to make an impression on these people. He cares about them and he, he wants them to know what's going on and uh, to live uh, by certain principles. And so he's going to do everything he knows how to do to instill those principles and thoughts and ideas and feelings in them. So, you know, I mean, I, you know, when I was a kid, I briefly went to a Presbyterian church and the preacher was very, um, he was kind of a flatliner. He never really got too excited about anything because I don't know, I guess that's the Presbyterian vibe. I don't know. It's just very much about like, where are we having lunch after this? And I thought, well, this isn't, really having much of an effect on anybody, is it? <laughs> so I didn't, I don't think, I didn't want to do that, yeah. <laughs> okay. Is anybody in the back? Sorry, time for, yeah, right there in the center. Yeah. Um, yeah, you mentioned the, I guess the four concerts that were uncovered in terms of concert footage that you had as source. I'm wondering about the rehearsal footage um, how much more of that was discovered and could a few of us come over and watch it? <laughs> the rehearsal footage is incredible, right? Yeah. Um, the, and the rehearsal footage, um, we're not even 100% sure what additionally all of this material was uh, originally uh, shot for. Um, but we assume uh, probably at some point possibly a television special. Yeah. Um, and there is um, a bit more uh, rehearsal footage. <laughs> and um, some of it you will find as extras on the DVD. And, um, you know, it's still in. There's always more to come. <laughs> okay, one more. The gentleman in the baseball hat right there. Right, yeah, right there. Oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I... I was working in Christian music, contemporary Christian music, which started kind of in the early 70s. And that's the, the people that Bob encountered at the Vineyard Fellowship, where there were many Christian artists, uh, Keith Green for one, the second chapter of Acts, who he was acquainted with. And I can tell you that the uh, spirit of the sermons that you presented from going back into the 20s was not the spirit of the Jesus People Movement revival or what you, he would have been hearing when he was studying at the Vineyard. Uh, I'm kind of saddened that 
the choice to do these fire and brimstone condemnation heavyweight things rather than the spirit of grace and love that was so fluent that attracted young people to that movement in that place that Bob responded to initially. Uh, so I'm kind of kind of really heartbroken that that wasn't more of the spirit or that he didn't really get involved with the project enough to, because he's gone beyond that, but uh, to really give you a sense of what the atmosphere was creatively in that movement in that time that he kind of took the ball and ran with on his own there that uh, I, I would have preferred to hear more of the, the, the sermonizing that he did at the time that the Tempe thing or many others that are on even on YouTube that you can get that were more a more of a real documentary of what his inner spirit was turmoiling over in those days. Well, you guys, as you had said already, you were trying to make a different kind of movie, so not the one that you wanted to see, I think, but you had, you had, had um, directives from Bob about what the subjects of the sermons the were. Subjects of the, sermon. yeah. the, the subjects of the sermons were given, yes. Um, the interpretation is my own. Sorry to have disappointed. And, and if I, to follow up from that, one of the things that I think is... Um, brilliant and frightening <laughs> about Luke's work is how relevant it is today uh, to such a T that, um, you know, the, the intent and the desired effect was that we overall have a classic representation of this preacher that could be from kind of any time. And um, thanks, Luke. You hit, you hit our current position right nail on the head. Well, I also think it's important, uh, like you said yourself, sir, you know, as beautiful a period as this was in Dylan's career, um, he's, he's moved on as well. And um, it's more complicated than just being happy. And, you know, I know that might have drawn him in. I know that's what draws a lot of people into religion is that it gives them some sense of relief or some sense of belonging or it eases their pain. But the questions that exist are still very difficult. And there's still a lot of pain and suffering in the world. So that sunshiny vibe isn't going to cut it. It's a little more complicated than that. Well, the, the message of the, good, the gospel is the good news of love. Well, and that's I'm not going to get out my sword and shield yeah, right now. Really? <laughs> <laughs> um, this was an awesome night. I want to thank you guys for coming and bringing us this film. It's an amazing piece of work. Thank, thank you. you thank you.